Wood for coming along today to this seminar entitled European Catalyst Films and Cinema Worldwide. Um, what I wanted to do just to get us started, we're going to be talking for about an hour and 15 minutes, something like that, okay? So we've got, we've got quite a lot to get through, but at the same time we want to leave a little bit of time for questions as well. And if you've got any observations to make, for example, perhaps in some of the films that you've seen as part of this series, or any questions that you've got for the um, roundtable par participants, um, you'll have ample opportunity to pose those questions. Okay, um, so we're going to have brief interventions, briefish interventions from our presenters, and then we'll throw it open. Um, okay, so first of all, just to introduce um, who we have here, it's the first thing that I need to do. Um, my name is Stephanie Dennison, and I'm reader in Brazil. My, my area of specialization is Latin American cinema, so that's what I'll be bringing to um, our discussions today. Um, and also present is um, Professor Paul Cook, who is our new Chair of World Cinemas at the Centre for World Cinemas at the University of Leeds. Um, he's a specialist in contemporary German cinema and European heritage film. We also have present Mariana Lees, um, who is a new colleague at the Centre for World Cinemas, who recently completed a PhD in European cinema uh, and has a forthcoming book entitled The Europeanness of European Cinema. Um, and also Alan O'Leary, um, who's senior lecturer in Italian and um, also teaches world cinema and author of a number of books and articles on popular Italian film, um, terrorism and Italian cinema as well, and in particular the Cine uh, Panettone, which he probably will talk a little bit more about later perhaps. And also present, finally, uh, last but not least, Phil Lawrence, who runs Real Solutions, a consultancy company working in all areas of film. And he was previously creative director at the showroom Sheffield, head of film at National Media Museum, uh, building the Bradford Film Festival and Bradford Animation Festival, as well as a, a diverse programme of world cinema. And he's currently bringing back to audiences the Beyond the Mango Film Festival and remains passionate about providing opportunities for audiences to see non-mainstream cinema. So what we suggested then um, for, for this afternoon's discussion were uh, a number of key topics that we thought we might cover in relation to the, the general um, subject of capitalist films. So there they are listed for you to remind you. Is it possible to single out specific films that have impacted our understanding of the film medium? Um, how do these films help us understand what cinema is really about? I've put European cinema in brackets because we can talk about cinema more, more broadly speaking. Um, do capitalist films present an alternative history of cinema? And what is the popular perception of such films? So those are the kind of touchstones, if you like, that we'll, we'll be referring back to in our discussions. Okay, so again, just really to remind you what were the films that were listed as part of the European Capitalist Film um, section as part of the uh, Leeds International Film Festival? Because I appreciate there were an awful lot of films uh, being screened and you wouldn't necessarily have got to see them all. Um, so if we actually think about this in chronological order then, the first, chronologically the first film that was, that was listed as part of the Catalyst series was um, Lucino Visconti's um, Ossessione, Obsession, from 1943. Uh, thought of as the catalyst, okay, so the, 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 the mover, uh, the, the first example, if you like, of Italian neorealism. There's a couple of images there of the film itself. And Italian neorealism is something that we will perhaps inevitably be referring back to when we start to talk about what films influenced what other film movements, okay? So Italian realism in particular, so this is the post-Second World War um, film movement, if you like, I'm, I'm simplifying inevitably, um, that, uh, for example, made use of location shooting, uh, smaller budgets, reflecting on the, the, the underbelly, if you like, of society. So uh, uh, some kind of a counterpoint to the more glossy productions that would have come along before. Okay? Uh, and then again, continuing our chronology, we have uh, what is said to be the, the film that kick-started uh, the French New Wave or the Nouvelle Vague, which is Le Beau Serge by uh, Claude Chabrol from 1958. I couldn't resist putting that image of Claude Chabrol up there because it's just too good not to put up. It's far as it is. Um, and one of the things that we find uh, with these particular films, something that we could perhaps be thinking about and reflecting on, is that they're not necessarily the films that stand out as representative of a film movement. So the, those capitalist films perhaps get slightly forgotten in our discussion. So we're much more likely, I would suggest, to think of the films of Jean-Luc Godard, for example, um, as uh, indicative of what the, uh, the Nouvelle Vague was all about, rather than the first film that was said to, to kickstart the movement. OK? 
Okay. So again, we're starting to see the word new cropping up quite a bit, for those of you who are, are, are new to this aspect of film studies. Yeah? Uh, so there's something new. There, these are new waves, very often expressed in different ways, but ultimately this is, the, this is what they all have in common. Okay? Um, and then we have new German cinema thrown into the mix. So again, this is a film from 1966, um, Yesterday Girl, um, that was uh, beautifully introduced by one of our PhD students from the uh, Centre for World Cinemas. Um, is Joe here? Joe? Hello! Uh, who, and, and Joe may very well have something more to contribute perhaps afterwards um, uh, when, she, when, we, when we throw open the discussion. Um, Yesterday Girl, said to be, again, it's the Kickstarter, it's the catalyst for what went on to be referred to as the new German cinema. Some of those uh, features that we've already seen in the others would, would, would resonate with this. So again, it's this idea of uh, location shooting, that more uh, neo-realist, if you like, um, discussion of society, okay? Uh, and included, I haven't put up a slide, but, but we also have example of the Czech New Wave, um, and that was the film The Sun and the Net, um, and that was Stefan Neuhaus' film from 1962. So again, these, these are um, uh, new waves that aren't just located in those main, what we would, might think of as those main production areas of France, France, Germany, and Italy, just beyond. Um, and then, we jump on ahead a little bit. So the idea being that these uh, catalyst films didn't just emerge in the 50s and 60s and stop there. And that, that cinema keeps changing, keeps, keeps uh, reinventing itself to an extent. Uh, and so we have um, a, a dogma film. You could not discuss catalyst films and not include a film produced by the, the, the dog, dogma gang. Um, and this one is Thomas Winterberg, said to be the first film to follow the so-called um, dogma uh, manifesto, this vow of chastity. Uh, and again, location filming, handheld cameras, direct sound. So some of those features that, that you would discuss if you were talking about neorealism, for example, or even German new wave cropping up, cropping up again. Um, and then another um, more recent film that was included in the, in the capitalist list was Stuck and Doe, Romanian film said to, to kickstart the Romanian new cinema. So again, there are new waves, new cinemas. These waves don't stop, and they're not restricted to one, one particular place. So we talk about European capitalist films, and it's, it's, we can think a little bit afterwards about why we concentrate on the subject of Europe and pro products that come out of Europe, and is that perhaps where we should be starting, or should we be starting anywhere at all? Is there a starting point? Is there an end, etc.? But what it's good to remember, and it's at this point that we can throw, throw this open slightly, um, it's good to remember that these new waves uh, were also taking place beyond Europe. Um, so, for example, and there are plenty of examples on the program um, at, at the festival, there always are uh, examples of Japanese new wave, for example. Okay, so 1960s into the 1970s, and also Latin America. If we think about Latin American cinema as, as a thing, as an entity, and that's something that we could, we don't necessarily have to think about Latin American cinema that way, um, but it also was uh, affected, its cinema, cinema production was also affected by uh, new waves. It had its own set of capitalist films, okay? Uh, I mean, the image that I'm using here is, is quite a nice, from a very iconic film from the period, um, which is uh, San Quinez's Blood of the Condor from 1969. Uh, round about this time, of course, we find that there are plenty of interesting socio-political things going on in Latin America that would produce a different kind of cinema. So one of the things that we might want to bear in mind when we're thinking about cinemas and new waves outside Europe is that those new waves are not always referring back to European new waves. Um, this is something that I think we, can, we probably will find that we'll be talking a little bit more about as we, as we throw this open. An example in Latin America would be Brazilian Cinema Novo, the new cinema. And again, it's those same terms, the same kind of terminology that's being used, and which we normally date from around about 1962 till about 69, 70. They're normally the dates that we would give it. And again, if we were to define what Brazilian Cinema Novo is, um, we're talking about use of non-professional actors, location shooting, direct sound, gritty underbelly of society, films that have a sense of urgency about them, and very much referring to um, ne a neo-realist tradition. So yes, Italian neo-realism definitely would have been would have served as an inspiration um, for these kinds of films. Uh, but within Cinema Nova, we, ha we have our own catalysts. So within each uh, new wave outside of Europe, 
Um, there are catalysts that did exist there too. So there, there's a film that came before Resilience of Emanovo that's said to have kick-started the movement, yeah, served as a catalyst for the Resilience of Emanovo, which was a film by Nelson Pereira dos Santos, the film called Rio 40 Graus, or Rio 40 Degrees. Okay, and this is a film from 1959, I think. Didn't write it down, I should have, but it's silly. Um, and it's not a cinema novel film per se, more, more in a neo-realist style, but actually making reference to films that had already been produced in Brazil. Okay? And then just continuing on the subject of Brazilian cinema novel, because it's an interesting case in point to take a look at, um, it produced its own manifesto. This is something that we see a lot in these new waves. Very often they're accompanied by some kind of a, 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 a written a statement of purpose. Uh, and the Aesthetics of Hunger was, was written in 1965, written by one of the key players of the cinema Nova movement, Claudio Rocha, where he was arguing very much for a, a paring down of production. In other words, a, 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 an imaginary poverty, if you like, so that would reflect the poverty of the society that filmmakers were attempting to depict. So what we actually find is that we're not a million miles away from the dogma manifesto that comes much later on, for example. Uh, and I guess that's a key point that we maybe want to bear in mind, is that we tend to assume that the direction of flow would, is always from some kind of centre, um, in this case Europe, the European film production, outwards to some kind of periphery. But that's not necessarily how it works and not necessarily the best way of understanding films uh, and understanding um, the interconnectedness of film production, particularly in the 21st century. And with that in mind, I shall now hand over to our Chair of World Cinemas, um, who's going to talk a little bit about what we understand by World Cinema, Centre Periphery, question, and those kinds of discussions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about the Centre and the Centre's projects, if you like, if we can call it something as homogenous as that. Um, but the key thing I think that I want to talk about is the notion of catalyst film. What do we mean by catalyst film and how we can kind of problematise the notion of a catalyst film? Is it possible at all to even talk about this, this idea? So the aim of the centre, if I'm going to sound like a manifesto now, right? so the aim of the centre is to explore the cinema of the world as a, quote, polycentric phenomenon. Right? So the idea of that is to try to challenge the notion of centre and periphery when we start thinking about global film culture <clears throat> and to try to kind of take everything at face value, to try to democratise our approach to the world's cinema. Now that clearly is easier said than done. But one of the key things that we try to do in the centre is to deconstruct the straightforward narrative of the world's cinema. Okay. And in some ways, one of the things we try to do within that context is to problematise the very notion of a catalyst film. Because catalyst films are problematic. For a start, most catalyst filmmakers, if we want to call them that, um, don't know they're catalyst filmmakers. They, are kind of, they have their catalyst status thrust upon them later on for a variety of reasons, and we could talk about those reasons. Okay. But one of the things, you know, in the various projects that we've done in the Centre of World Cinema, one of the things that we do do are kind of trace flows of aesthetics, politics, um, personnel, talent, stories, myths across transnational spaces. Okay, so we try to kind of show how the world cinema works as an interconnected global landscape. And in doing that, we attempt to generate alternative maps. Okay, we try to sort of deconstruct the, the, the received story of the world's cinema, and there's numerous projects we could mention. Um, in an unashamed plug for tonight's Christopher Frayling event, I'd like to do a little plug for Lee Broughton's work on uh, rewriting the story of the Western. So his work kind of takes the history of the Western and talks about it from a, a Euro-Western point of view and looks at what that, if you, if you take that particular optic, how it changes our understanding of the um, development of the Western as a genre. So Lee looks at the sauerkraut western, the spaghetti western, the British western, and looks at how certain aesthetic and political innovations that are attributed to the kind of uh, the standard story of the western are problematized if you start to see the western as a phenomenon of the world's cinema. Okay, so that's just one example. But within that, we try to adopt what we call a situated approach to our understanding of global cinema. So we always attempt to look at the contingency 
of film culture and film production. And within that, one of the key things that we try to do is problematise the very notion of what we mean by world cinema. Okay? It's very important to us, I think, that the, the centre is called the Centre for World Cinemas. Okay? The notion of world cinema is itself a construction. And generally, it seems to be a kind of atemporal, um, transnational phenomenon that um, you, know, you have this sort of canon of film texts that exist, that, um, that somehow seem to be speaking to each other, that are sometimes, certainly within um, sort of film studies discourses, divorced from their context of production. And if you look at the contingency of those films, they can start to create other stories. So what's interesting about the notion of a catalyst film is on the one hand, it seems to speak to that standard story, right? So you can take Ossessioni as the first um, uh, neorealist film and uh, you know we know where that kind of goes but if you look at it uh, more broadly you look at it within the wider context of Italian film production uh, which I can't do but Alan certainly can um, you know you start to see other stories emerging so if we take something like um, Yesterday's Girl okay uh, that's you know that's quite often seen as a catalyst for the new German cinema but in telling that story um, what is generally elided is the significance of another film a film called Jonas that we are now seeing um, uh, emerging in the scholarship as the genuine catalyst for the new German cinema, a film that predates um, Yesterday's Girl by something like five years. That's not to say that Yesterday's Girl isn't really important, isn't a significant film, and that Alexander Kluger isn't a very significant figure within German and global film culture. But actually, by focusing in on that film, you elide lots of the other things that are really significant in the story of New German Cinema and also the story of Alexander Kluger. Arguably more significant is the fact that um, Alexander Kluger, who was a lawyer uh, within the Frankfurt School, spent a lot of time um, restructuring the film funding landscape of German society in the early 1960s. It was much more of a kind of uh, genuine catalyst for film production. And what's interesting about that as well is also, in doing that, he also set the seeds of, the, of its own destruction. So lots of the funds that he set up ended up um, spawning the soft porn phenomenon in German film of the 1970s. Okay, so if we kind of take a more situated, contingent view of Alexander Kluger's place within German film culture, you start to see the, sto the straightforward story of the new German cinema becoming something different. And there are loads of examples of that. There are loads of examples of how catalyst films actually help, actually need to be seen as a construction. So we take another kind of standard narrative. We take a film like M, Fritz Lang's film from the early 1930s. That's often seen as kind of um, a key film in the, gener in the generation of film noir of the 1950s. Not just because Fritz Lang moved from uh, Hollywood to uh, from, from Germany to Hollywood, but also more broadly because of the kind of the aesthetics in the film, the use of chiaroscuro and all this sort of stuff. But what's interesting is the story that's not as told as frequently is why that film is seen as so central to the generation of um, film noir. Clearly it was significant, but you know, there were a whole bunch of film cultures that were significant to um, film noir, but a lot of this was to do with um, the, the role of Cahiers de Cinema in the construction of film noir as a genre, right? They desperately wanted to see European antecedents. It fitted in with their kind of um, uh, political approach to filmmaking and their, co their construction of what um, film quality involves, okay? And sort of a basic um, anti-American snobbery amongst that crowd of, crowd of filmmakers as well and, 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 and critics. So you see that there are kind of reasons why that becomes the film that's canonized within the story of film noir. And I think that when we're talking about um, the notion of a catalyst film within the context of our approach to world cinema as a polycentric phenomenon that we have to look at from a situated point of view. It's really important to try to uncover those various narratives. Segwaying into Alan, I think the key word here is problematization, isn't it? We need to, it's not even a word, but it's a key word. We need to problematize and we need to problematize our film history. So the accepted version of how we got to where we are now really needs to be questioned, which is what the centre, of course, is all about. And uh, there's where I come in, actually. I'm going to continue with this non-existent keyword of problematisation. Um, what I'm interested in, I suppose, to say in my own work as well as in this particular talk, is uh, to somehow speak from the perspective of the popular. I think we've got a self-selecting audience here today and also on this panel. You're all cinephiles, right? You're lovers of film. I'm speaking against you today, by which I mean I'm trying to, uh, if you like, speak for the centre, for the mainstream, and imagine how things would look 
if you were thinking of the catalyst film from the perspective of the popular as distinct from the cinephile perspective. So the kind of films we're supposed to know about, the neorealist ones, the cinema novo, uh, the dogma films, wonderful as they all are, are perhaps not the central ones if you start looking at um, uh, what the catalyst films might be from the point of view of um, mainstream success. Okay, one of the most influential films being from that perspective. So this is why I've kind of introduced a second term here where I'm thinking not so much of catalysts as of prototypes. And just, you know, uh, slightly patronizing me to give you um, a definition there of prototype just to remind you. What I really have in mind is, is the first original or typical form of something or the first or preliminary version of something. And I'm talking about films here, obviously, when I'm suggesting not catalysts, but prototypes. Now, the reason for doing this, um, a catalyst is a chemical that's present and that enables, facilitates a chemical reaction, but it itself is not affected by that reaction. So you can see that it's a, a metaphor, in other words, a disguised metaphor drawn from nature. Uh, prototypes, on the other hand, and this is where I really want to uh, 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 put my emphasis here, will signify something that's more to do with artifice, something that's constructed, okay? Which, of course, films are. They're not natural at all. Um, the whole back to basic, basics kind of rhetoric of the new this, the new that, just pointing the camera at the world, has this kind of natural authenticity, as you I've put it up there, the, these values built into, uh, into that discourse. But actually, we can challenge those by thinking precisely of how technology is central to cinema and central always to how it progresses. Soon after uh, 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 Lars von Trier made his... Um, uh, you know, vow of chastity with the dogma films. He then went off and started using digital technology, uh, and couldn't have, you know, couldn't have made the films that he now makes without that. Likewise, to talk of catalyst perhaps puts the emphasis on art. You know, it, it's something that, uh, as I say, natural is kind of a natural art. It's just creativity that comes from the human being and so on. But really, cinema is an industry. Uh, so to talk about prototype which has this kind of mechanistic notion, we think of vehicle prototypes. Yes, why not think of films in those ways? And actually, Kristen Thompson, the great scholar of cinema, uh, or the partner of David um, uh, Bordwell, who many of you will be very familiar with, uh, has talked precisely of how, how the blockbuster, the American blockbuster, is a prototype film, often. Um, so really what I'm trying to do here is to note that in this notion of catalyst, we have uh, uh, an embedded notion of cinephilia, which has all of these various values implied. Uh, but I'd like to oppose that and to point out, if you like, that we need to unpick the kind of evaluative oppositions that are present by talking about prototypes, so talking about popular cinema going. And I'm going to suggest, actually, if we want to look about for one, let's say, the key prototypical, and indeed, if you want to call it a, a catalyst film of the last few years, has certainly been The Matrix. Uh, this is the great catalyst film of um, uh, uh, the last, whatever, 15 or so years. And of course, precisely what we're dealing with here is industry and technological innovation. What The Matrix allowed people to do, because of the kind of technology, with the bullet time technology and so on that many of you will be familiar with, uh, was extraordinary and has had a global effect. So the film on the left is a Rajni Kant film. Rajni Kant is one of the biggest stars in the world. You've probably never heard of him because you're not from the Indian subcontinent or Africa or various other places. Uh, he's uh, a very unprepossessing 60-year-old from uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, the kind of Tamil area of, uh, he's a Tamil star basically. I hope I haven't got that wrong. Uh, but he, a couple of years ago, made um, a film called Robot, which is uh, extremely influenced by the Matrix. The point about this is that precisely the technological innovation here is the thing, if you like. What technology has made possible uh, in terms of spectacle in the Matrix has been massively influential in various uh, films, uh, various film industries around the world, various film cultures. The Matrix is really the cap catalyst, or as I say, a better because a more industrial term, the prototype here. Uh, for this Indian film, but for many others also, including, of course, many sequels uh, or pseudo-sequels or, or in that sort of uh, um, what I'm going to call filone or formal or cycle of films made in uh, Hollywood itself. Now, the term I've just used, filone, is, some, is one that many of you might be familiar from talking about the kind of Italian films that were exported in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. For example, like Spaghetti Western. The first Spaghetti Western was by Sergio Leone in uh, 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 1964. It came out, it was with Clint Eastwood called A Fistful of Dollars. 
and it generated something like 450 subsequent films that conformed in some respect to this prototype. So again, if you want to talk about it in cinephile terms, we can talk about it as a catalyst film. Of course, it's never discussed as such because it's not in this back-to-basics tradition. Um, likewise, Hercules, a peplum, a so-called sword and sandal film from 1957, I think it was, started its own formula. This is an Italian film with then Mr. Universe, I think it was Steve Reeves, an American muscle man, uh, which generated dozens of copies, if you want to call them that but certainly dozens of uh, followers. So it's again a prototype, um, and I use this term because it puts the emphasis on industry rather than um, catalyst, which seems to put the emphasis instead on something like art. So I'm gonna bring you to another example. Paul very justly talked about how in the Center for World Cinema what we're interested in is situated knowledge about cinema. Uh, and this means sometimes that International cinephilia, the kind of thing that you get, you, your kind of cultural capital, let's put it like that, that you accrue through attendance at film festivals, ignores often that which is hugely popular and well known at home in given uh, national or cultural, uh, uh, lo local, regional or national cinemas. For example, the Chinipani Pony, which uh, uh, Steph introduced earlier. It means, and it sounds like uh, a pastry precisely because it's called after the Chinipani Pony. These are Christmas films. You could translate it as film Christmas cake. Uh, the prototype of these films, Christmas cake, was a film called Vacante di Natale. I've put it in large print there at the top. Christmas holidays from 1983. It generated, as you can see to date, something like 28 follow-ups, some of which have a similar uh, title. So you have Vacante di Natale, Christmas holidays, 1991, 19, 2000, and then 2011 again. Now the point about this is that you might be tempted as uh, film festival cinephiles to look down upon this stuff, except that these movies throughout at least the new century were the annually the most successful films in Italy. That is to say, outperforming various Harry Potter movies, outperforming uh, uh, other films like that. And when Avatar was released in Italy, it was released as December, Christmas release in every, practically every, as it were, jurisdiction in the world, apart from Italy, because they didn't want to have to um, uh, 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 compete against um, these films. Now, so what we have here is a prototype that's generating a whole and influential sequence. Um, but what I want to point out is that if you're uh, a member of the cinema going public in Italy who consumes these films rather than the catalyst films you're supposed to like, um, your vision of what our catalyst films will look quite different. And actually, they will look like this. These are the films that turn out, if you're looking from, as it were, the perspective of the Chinapani Pony, or at least of its audience, that will turn out to be vital. So films like uh, uh, A Fish Called Wanda from 1988, or There's Something About Mary from, I forget, 1999, I think, um, which introduced kind of gross out and violent aspects to the comedy of the Chinapani Pony. So again, my point, and if you like, it's a kind of a simple one, but I think it's a necessary one, is that we, in a sense, we have to shift, or we should sometimes at least, recognize that the whole cinephilia perspective is not the only one. And that we have to give a dignity to kind of popular forms uh, and look from the perspective of a popular cinema going public, and we'll see that cinema history looks very different indeed. That the catalysts are different, and that perhaps we need to think in terms of, as I say, prototype excuse me, prototypes rather than catalysts for the reasons that I said. And that looking from this perspective, we will find that other films turn out to be central. Uh, and which is why I've put here Road to Morocco uh, with Bing Crosby and, um, and Bob Hope as well as Dorothy Lamour and the whole Road to series as again, one of those central kind of uh, catalyst moments, if you like, in cinema. Um, I've been waging a quixotic and rather hopeless campaign against the kind of privileging of cinephilia, I should say, on Twitter. So if you would like to join me, <laughs> here's the hashtag. Um, and I would like to finish really with a kind of call to arms. If you love cinema, it's time to hate cinephilia. We have to be against cinephilia. So join me in my campaign on Twitter, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Um, <laughs> Mariana's thinking to herself, okay, right. I'll just uh, is it, yeah, yeah, well, okay. yeah. Okay, so I have the tough mission here after hearing about how we uh, are all about world cinema and all about popular and not art. 
uh, to come back to the issue of European, really. Um, and what I want to do first is just say a few things about what it is that we mean by European. And then finally, um, address this question of what do Catalyst films um, can tell us about uh, the meaning of European. And also at the same time, how it, whether it's useful at all to read these films um, as European. Now, of course, European, we, we also have a bigger problem even because there's, there's a, a, a huge issue of definition. It's very difficult to define Europe, uh, let alone the, adject uh, the adjective that um, comes from a European. So we might say, okay, it's a geographical concept, but already here we have an issue with where, where do we limit uh, Europe? Of course, Russia being the eternal sort of uh, non-European, European part of Europe. Um, we can think about whether Eastern Europe belongs to it, and we've talked about the Romanian new wave and how we come back to new sort of parts of Europe as well, we, we've had in history. Um, this is also, of course, a geopolitical problem. So it's not just Russia, but if you think about Turkey, uh, which is for now um, the longest negotiate, uh, negotiating member trying to access the EU, they've been a negotiation since the 80s, uh, now surpassed by so many other con countries. And of course, it's not just to do with geography, but with the fact that we're talking about the possibility of having Muslim Europe within Europe, so again, another problem. And of course, then we have the issue of as Muslim Europe shows of cultural definition. So we can try to define Europe in terms of Hellenism, Roman law, the Enlightenment, um, and through concepts like universality, humanism, cosmopolitanism, um, we come to the post-World War II period of stability. If you think about um, the EU was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize just last year, so we come back to this idea that Europe is the, con the, c the continent of humanism, of peace. Um, but then, of course, this also falls through with a, a very significant crisis today. Now, already in the three attempts of, um, in defining European, you see that also European is often tied to the EU. Um, and this means that, especially today, it couldn't be more challenged. So not only has it been difficult to define, today it's become sort of impossible to define or not to challenge. It's challenged on a political level, on an economic level, on, of course, a cultural level. Again, we can um, sort of date this uh, more or less 2005 with the failure or the rejection of the constitutional treaty. Now, I wish I could also get away uh, with just telling you, okay, we can't define Europe, that's it, let's move on. But um, we could say that there are um, attempts to define Europe. And I would um, mention two that are specific to uh, not just European, but European cinema. What's interesting about these attempts to define is that both of them define Europe through opposition. So I want to talk about two sort of comparisons that uh, try to define European cinema. The first of these is art versus industry. So we have here the European cinema is not normally following this sort of integrated production system. <coughs> um, we, get, we can think about classical Hollywood, but still Hollywood. There are not many studios, even though there are studios. Um, we have a huge market fragmentation. I mean, we're talking about cultural fragmentation, linguistic fragmentation. The fact that the problem with, Europeans fil with European films is that most of them are unable to travel because um, there's a problem with language, but also culturally specific jokes, for instance, the case of comedy. Um, also political fragmentation, you can think about embargoes, quota systems, etc. So we have this sense that European films are not industrial products, they're something else. Um, and this was particularly visible in um, the early 90s. Again, we, we see this uh, match with European integration. So if you think um, about the GATT negotiations of 93, now called, uh, this is now the World Trade Organization, but at the time, or became famous, or, or this helped to define European cinema in the sense of art versus industry, because France very famously opposed um, the United States. They wanted to, to abolish quota systems in Europe, and they wanted to make sure that whole Hollywood films could compete with national films. And France said no, the famous exception culturelle, which became Europe's cultural exception. Right? So it, it started by being something uh, very national, and it's um, now pan-European, the sense that we are not um, in a market, we're doing something else. Uh, we can, of course, this goes back to the issue of the populace. Now, if we're not in a market, we're doing something else. The second uh, opposition that defines Europe and European cinema is, of course, Europe versus the US, normally Hollywood. Um, Europe's significant other is um, Hollywood. European cinema is not made for profit. It's not about action. It's not really about narrative, it's about characters, it's about emotion, psychology. Um, 
And here, um, like Alan mentioned, David Bordwell, when Bordwell defines art cinema, he means European cinema in this sense. So there are all these cliches of European cinema being slow, intellectual, also more sexually explicit. Now, I've been talking about GATT, European integration, opposition to Hollywood, and you see that um, these ideas of Europe, European cinema, go back to at least um, the early 90s. But we could challenge this and try to think um, in, in more contemporary terms. Some of the films that you had in this um, season were more recent. So how can we um, sort of think about it today? And what are the challenges to this perceived Europeanness of European cinema? Now, of course, one thing is that these boundaries between art and mainstream are blurred. Perhaps they were never there, but certainly now, uh, in today's context, in today's postmodern context, they are completely blurred, blurred and we have something else. Yes, Hollywood is important, but we're also trying to decenter Hollywood, and certainly that's the work of the Center for World Cinemas, is not to see Hollywood as the model that other national cinemas would try to um, either imitate or diverge from, it's just something else. And then you have people, uh, very famous scholars like Thomas Althusser, suggesting that actually European cinema is just world cinema, it's just one part of it. Now when I, when I hear uh, people say European cinema is just world cinema, I would think of examples like The Artist, very famous European film that is actually um, engaging in a, a crucial dialogue with Hollywood, but it's also a model for world uh, cinematic production. We could think about Slumdog Millionaire, a British film uh, shot in India, etc. But actually, El Sasser does, doesn't have these films in mind. When he's talking about European cinema is world cinema, he means festival films are world films. And again, we go back to this idea that Europe is all about quality. It's not Hollywood. It's not uh, mainstream. But perhaps these changing paradigms can also help us to rethink the history of European cinema. Um, that is, yes, some of these films are more recent, and I think um, they challenge this new paradigm. But what about the films in the 50s? Were they really just art films? Were they really just conforming to this idea? Um, or the films in the 60s, all of these new waves. Now, like Stephanie said, all of the films that you have are somehow labeled as new. Neorealism, French New Wave, Czech New Wave, New German Cinema, Romanian New Wave, and then Dogma. That doesn't have anything new, but you know, you know just bear with me and accept that it is. Um, and this can be a new realism, Ossessione, um, more sexual content, Ossessione, Le Beau Serge, The Sun in the Net, a new language, a new cinematic language, the French New Wave, New German Cinema, Dogma. The discovery of a new culture, and here, crucially, again, the Romanian New Wave is also about Western critics discovering Romania rather than a new language being formed in European cinema, but also, of course, a new country sort of emerging post trust dictatorship. Um, and this sense of the new, I think, is interesting because what we see here is actually that European cinema is like a site for experimentation, right? So we have everything that is new is European, or everything that is European is new. So if Hollywood is mainstream and popular, and exaggerating the issue here, of course, repeats the formula. So we know once you've seen one classical Hollywood film, you've seen all of them. Of course, I'm exaggerating. European cinema does something completely different. It does something new. But perhaps more importantly, it does it well. That is, when we put together these films and call them not just capitalist films, but European capitalist films, we're suggesting European cinema does something new and in doing something that is to do with experimentation, it's also doing something that is to do with quality. Uh, so quality is crucial as a means of distinction here. That is, for the critics and for people who put together this kind of what European cinema is all about, especially at a time of convergence and dissolution of borders, politically but also culturally. Uh, if finally we have something that can merge high and low culture, high and low brow, uh, for, for this period of crisis in European cinema, in, in Europe today, um, it's crucial to have something that is new and that is to do with quality. Um, and I just want to, this is very short, but I just want to finish by saying that it's obviously not the case that other catalyst films, we've talked about Brazilian cinema novel, are not quality films or couldn't do something new and with quality. Um, but this tends to be the canon um, 
it tends to be the way that uh, scholars and critics and cinephiles tend to approach European cinema, is through this view of new and current. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Bill, if I could um, pass the mic over to you. Um, we've heard from um, four academics uh, talking about films, capitalist films, what we mean by that, what we should mean by that. Um, but it would be interesting to hear your take as someone who, you know, is more closely linked to the industry, should we say, and as someone who, you know, has a background in programming. What's your take on the subject yeah. of capitalist films? Um, well, I didn't, didn't actually prepare anything, so what I'm going to say now will either be a long, interminable ramble or straight to the point or too short. Um, <coughs> hopefully, I'll get it just right. Um, first of all, I really love academics. It's really great how they look back on history and justify what we did. Um, but actually, we don't do it that way. Um, you know, pick up the first point about dogma. Um, and I got this direct from the head of the Danish film school. They got really fed up with the fact that students kept using all the special effects and everything, and they weren't concentrating on the basics of filmmaking, which was acting and composing the shots. And so they said, you're not allowed to use sound, you're not allowed to use mu music, um, it has to be straight to the point, and these were the, these were the things that were laid down and said the students had to do it. One of the students was Lars von Trier, who if he's gifted at anything, it's marketing, mm -hmm. and he called it, he called it dogma. He even had the brilliant idea of actually numbering them. So the guy from the Danish film school was a little bit annoyed that he didn't get the credit for it. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, last one created. And I think one of the issues around a lot of these different things is they actually come out of circumstances. They're not created by the people who decide, oh, let's invent neorealism, let's start making, making films in this manner. I think it happened because of post-war damage to the Italian economy and the fact that there wasn't a, a studio system set up and so they see the better of doing with I suspect it's the same case in a lot of Latin American production as well, that you deal with the circumstances that you're left with. Um, the ideas around capitalist films I, I, I think are in interesting because it's a way in which academics can actually create a model for how, um, how film actually works. What in the film industry we tend to call it plagiarism, but it's, it's very straightforward. You know, if you look at um, contemporary Bollywood cinema, there's so many copies of American movies that have been made because it's the easiest thing to do. And filmmakers know when they want a good thing. Why not copy something? If it works, Bond, as in James Bond, as in Christmas movies in Italy, why not do it 24, 25 times? Because you've already established a brand, it's really easy to keep telling it. Now I'm going to make a claim that the first cap uh, capitalist film was probably shot by the Lumiere brothers in about 1895, which is a factory workers leaving the factory gate. And that was then copied successfully by many showground uh, film, um, fil fil filmmakers and moviegoers. And they would, they would go to a town, Mitchell and Kenyon did this most, most famously around, around Britain, they would go to a town on the Friday, film the fa workers leaving the factory gates on the Friday, say, if you want to see this film, come to the fairground tomorrow and you'll see yourself on the film. There were so many workers leaving the factory gate films that Tom Gunn, who's an academic at the University of Chicago, has done an entire thesis about them. These are sort of three-minute movies about workers walking out of the factory. And they were so successful as a means of getting people to come and watch your movie and pay to, pay to see yourself on film. But I think that was probably the first of those capitalist movies back in the 19th century. So I think it's great to actually do this, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the fact that when we make films, we know what's going to sell. And that's why we do it, that's why we copy it, that's why we, we, that's why we mimic it. And it's a shortcut to selling the stereotype to people. Nobody actually really wants to see something original. When we used to do, um, when we used to do um, surveys at the museum, and we'd, we'd ask people what films we want to see, this is in 1992, um, I knew it was a waste of time, but there's always people high up in marketing who know that, that, that they're onto a, a good thing. And uh, they, they, they do these surveys and people write down, we want to see the Terminator. But it just came out, it's been shown over the last six months. Why do you want to see it? They don't really want to see it. They want to see something like it, which is a bit better, that's going to take them a little bit further. But that's the brand that's in their mind and that's what they understand. I want to pick up the point that Alan was making as well about commercial cinema. And I, and I, and I do think this is something I, I, I have been a little bit concerned about. And I do think it's really interesting that we see in this country an example of um, cinema from other countries has been filtered through so many different people and is actually selected by a very rarefied group of people known as um, acquisition people in, dis in distribution who see films at festivals. Now those films at festivals are certainly going to the competition stand 
have already been selected by a group of people to, um, to call themselves programmers or directors of festivals, and they choose those films. They then get chosen by distributors. And so by the time it's been filtered through those processes, you don't see films that represent the country that they come from at all. You see films that represent the taste of the distribution companies who decide what films to put into, um, in, into cinemas or into festivals. When you go to the market of festivals like Cannes, and you go into the cinemas where nobody else goes, then you see the commercial cinema from other countries. And it is actually fascinating. It, it, it is very, very interesting. And I see films, I see films from, 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 from Thailand, um, Malaysia, etc., of commercial cinema, which I think is absolutely extraordinary. But there's no way any distributor in this country would ever buy those films for distribution in the UK. Um, largely because the audience already predefines itself. The audience of, as I say, cinephiles, don't actually want to go and see films that represent commercial cinema in another country. They want to go and see art house films that are very hard. And that's Damon. Absolutely, you're a disgrace. <laughs> absolutely a disgrace. Um, but those are, anyway, those are some of the points I just want to make. So I don't want to go into ego or something like that. But I think it's, it's, an, it's an interesting, I think in many ways it's a, it's a cart before the horse discussion. But I think that's what academic analysis is. And, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> So I, 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 I mean, let's see where, where, where the conversation goes and see where we end up. Okay, you could both give your points on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a certain, I, I'm thinking to myself, you know, when you think of the capitalist films and the discussion that we would have about something that we would call capitalist, um, we like to define things, don't we? We like Absolutely. to group things together, because that's how our mind works. It's not that different, is it, from the programmer and how the programmer's mind necessarily works, particularly with the... This aspect of marketing that you've been yeah. referring to. I, th I, th I think the, the programmers are, I often approach things from an ac academic perspective, but filmmakers don't. You know, I mm -hmm. think if you look at you know, capitalists in recent, you know, um, recent British cinema, they, then I'm not, I have no idea what the first film was, but it might be something like you know, Sex and Peace, and then everybody wants to make gangster movies. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so that's because Sex and Peace has been successful, <laughs> British movies, where people want to be successful, so gangster mm -hmm. movies are successful, therefore I will be successful. Um, mm -hmm. And it follows that route. Um, a program is work, work in a different way, I think. And we sit around worrying about the fact that there's a lot of British gangster movies that I don't want to show. So how do you how do you counteract that as a program event? I mean, if, if, if the impetus is coming, you know, from the audience and they want to, to uh, watch something they've seen before, but takes them a little bit further, it's, how can uh, you help? Them well, it's, 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 it's very difficult because um, you have to break programs down into categories. I mean, the, the festival programmers, um, such as you know, Louise and I, but then you, you can actually go out and select films put together a festival program where it, it, it's basically no holds barred when it comes down to the program. Once you move into, into cinemas, then you're very restricted by what the distributors are trying to distribute. But even more so, you, you are restricted by what will make money because in, increasingly, um, <coughs> The, the advertising spend that is attached to commercial cinema um, means that those films that would take money from cinema, whereas the advertising spend attached to the, the smaller title, that you may, you may take a recent title for it, such as um, uh, uh, Han Hannah Arendt, uh, which is released by Soda Pictures. Um, the Soda Pictures are a very small company, they don't have a huge amount of, uh, of, of spend. So the go to the cinemas and try and get them to take, take the film. The cinemas know that they don't have a great deal of, of spend. They're competing against titles, of, I mean, I think it's the same, same week, uh, such as Rush and Diana. Um, and people, for some reason, decide that they'd rather show Diana than show Hannah Arendt. Um, I'm not too sure what I want to say about that. <laughs> um, and, the, and ultimately, you know, Diana does take a lot more money. Um, but about six hundred and fifty thousand pounds compared to somewhere about twenty thousand pounds, I think. So you know that comes down to the number of cinemas that it goes into, and people are backing success, even though it's a prop. Um, but it's they think it's going to be successful because it's got a huge spend behind it, and it's it's that economics of the industry. And so as a program in cinema, you are trapped by the economics of the industry, and if you step outside of that, then you run the risk of putting on a film and your cinema attention. Um, so increasingly you, you move towards the more commercial area and rather than build audiences. Building audiences is actually hard work. Mm -hmm. um, but if you find your cinephiles, then 
you can make something happen. Right. But, but, and you, you, you can exercise flexibility on the push server flexible program where it's, it, it's basically no holds barred, you can cancel programs. Once you move into, into cinema, then you're very restricted by what you can do as a part of distribute. But even more so, you, you are restricted by what will make money because in, increasingly, um, <coughs> the, the advertising spend that is attached to commercial cinema um, means that those films will take money from cinema, whereas the advertising spend attached to the, the smaller title, so you may, you may take a recent title for it, such as um, uh, uh, the Hannah Arendt, uh, which is released by Soda Pictures. Um, the Soda Pictures are a very small company, they don't have a huge amount of, uh, of, of spend. So the, the, the cinema can try and get them to take, take the film. The cinemas know that they don't have a great deal of, of spend. They're competing against titles, at, I mean, I think it's the same, same week, uh, such as Rush and Diana. Um, and people, for some reason, decide that they'd rather show Diana than show Hannah Arendt. Um, I'm not too sure I would say about that. Um, and, the, and ultimately, you know, Diana does take a lot more money. Um, but about £650,000 compared to somewhere around about £20,000, I think. So, you know, that comes down to the number of cinemas that it goes into and people are backing success, even though it's a prop. Um, but it's, they think it's going to be successful because it's got a huge spend behind it. And it's, it's that economics of the industry. And so as a program in cinema, you are trapped by the economics of the industry. And if you step outside of that, then you run the risk of putting on a film and your cinema is empty. Um, so increasingly, you, you move towards the more commercial area and rather than build audiences. Building audiences is actually hard work. Mm -hmm. um, but if you find your cinephiles, then you can make something happen. We're getting, we're getting a mixed story here about cinephilia today, which is really <laughs> frank, but anyway, we'll let that one go. I'm afraid we're going to have to end it at that point, um, but can I just thank you all very much indeed for coming along and encourage you to go and watch the rest of the films in the last couple of days at the festival. Thank you.